<laughs> how are you, sir? I, I can't tell you how thrilled I am to be able to talk to you for but a moment. Thank you for finding the time to talk to us. How are you doing? How are you getting on? Are you okay? Well, the work I do is more intense than ever, you know, helping these vaccine companies work together, trying to get out of uh, this pandemic. Uh, yeah, I'm, I love that I get to stay home, no business travel. So I'm, I'm doing well. I almost feel guilty about that. Has people asking you about COVID-19 and vaccines replaced people asking you for advice on how to fix their computers? Has that changed? <laughs> Have they replaced each other? Well, yeah, the work I do at the foundation, I've been full-time at since 2008, it's usually pretty obscure. Malaria, TB... You know, people like Dr. Fauci and I, you know, they don't know what to discuss with us. It's weird that now infectious disease is, is uh, the main thing people are talking about. Now, we've all had to make huge adjustments in the way that we work. I mean, how have things changed for you? I imagine they've changed hugely. What, like, what is a typical day in Bill Gates' life? Well, I get up, uh, I see what's going on with the disease, how many new cases, how many new deaths. I look at the reports on all the research we're backing to make these tools, and then I'm on phone calls, uh, mostly video calls with government people, with the pharmaceutical companies, with the scientists at the foundation, uh, saying, hey, every month we gain, you know, getting the vaccine done, uh, getting it out to the entire world will save trillions and all this misery. So. Uh, we're working very intensely, and, you know, I'm, I'm proud the team is rallying around this, uh, uh, trying to end the disaster. I mean, two of your children, I know, are, are away at school, and there's been, there's been a lot of reporting of COVID-19 outbreaks at colleges. As a father, what, what advice, what do you say to your kids? To, how, what do you say to them in order to be safe while they're away at college? Well, fortunately, young people are not at gigantic risk, and uh, they certainly hear about mask wearing and social distancing a lot. I think they're, they are being very careful. Uh, you know, we're lucky enough that from time to time we can access a test just to make sure uh, if there's any kind of symptom that, that somebody's feeling. Uh, you know, they, they're, uh, you know, over 18 now, and so I've got to trust them, and uh, I think they're showing good judgment. It is a bit tricky with uh, the one that's still at home, which of her friends, you know, we sort of made her pick just a few friends that are being very careful and only see them. Well, that, I think, is one of the biggest things that's, that's happening now and has been happening the last few months and will continue to happen is essentially it becomes about trust. Like, my wife and I, we have young children, and you start thinking, well, do we trust that family? That's where Instagram's <laughs> very useful. You can go and look at Instagram and go... People tell you they're being safe. Two drinks in. Two drinks in, they're, they're posting videos from a bar, and you're like, sorry, son, that kid's not your friend anymore. <laughs> um, now, you're going to be celebrating your 65th birthday next week, but when you were in your 20s, what did you imagine that you'd be doing in your 60s? I'm afraid I didn't have that much respect for the, uh, you know, the deep thinking and innovation and ability to learn even if people in their, their 50s. I mean, my whole industry was young people, and we were like, hey, what do old people do? So uh, I've had a complete uh, counter-revelation that, you know, old people can be very uh, creative and, and do great work. I mean, when it comes to your birthday, I do have great sympathy for Melinda, your wife, and any of your friends and your children, because you must be impossible to shop for. Like, what, what, yeah, do, what used, does a loved one get Bill Gates? They, uh, they used to buy me movies or music, but now, you know, you can't... You know, I just have a subscription. They, they can still buy me books. Uh, I get a lot of the clothes. You know, I play tennis. A lot of V-necks. Uh, I wear these sweaters. A lot of V-necks. Uh, I do have a, a closet full, so... <laughs> uh, I, I'm not a man who need, needs much. Do you know what I'm going to send you on your birthday? Five dollars in a card. <laughs> wow, thank you. Genuinely, and I will do that. I'll do, I'm going to make a point to do that every year. I'm going to send you $5 in a card. That's what I'm going to do. 
Now, let's talk about your foundation, which uh, is doing the most and has been doing for the, for the past 20 years, the most incredible work. The, your current focus is on the development and the distribution of a COVID-19 vaccine. I feel like there's so much different information about this. There's so many different things being written on timelines and all those things. I feel like you know better than anybody on planet Earth. How close are we right now to a viable vaccine? Well, the key is to have a, a strong regulator, uh, which the US FDA is, is considered the best, really examine the data and say, is this vaccine safe? Does it stop you from transmitting to other people? And does it avoid you getting sick? And so that so-called phase three process is underway. Before the end of the year, it's possible one of the vaccines would get through. But the good news is that uh, by spring next year, we're likely to have two to four of these first six uh, that are already in the trials have them approved and then, you know, would be starting to get those out uh, to the high priority patients and eventually to everyone in the entire world. So now when you see, without naming any names, when you see uh, certain political leaders <laughs> talking about, oh, there's a vaccine coming, it'll be here in no time, and all those sorts of things. How do you feel when you watch those sorts of news stories and you think, well, don't tell people that. You know, the messaging should be just stay safe, wear a mask, keep your distance. Well, how do you feel yeah. when you see those sort of clips? Well, it's really unfortunate because it makes people think the vaccine may, may get approved because of political pressure and that we're not applying the very high safety bar. Now, fortunately, the FDA, uh, the companies, they're not going to let that happen. Uh, we'll have a strong safety database here, uh, but it shouldn't be subject to politics. Politics shouldn't take credit for it or pressure it or anything of that kind. And in particular, they ought to let the scientists, uh, Dr. Fauci and the CDC spokespeople get out there and you know remind us to listen to them instead of denigrating them whenever they say a little bit of bad news about how the uh, epidemic is continuing. Because, you know, but so many people are talking about a vaccine, and when I see people speaking about a vaccine, finding a, like you say, finding a vaccine that is safe is one thing. Uh, manufacturing and distributing this to an entire planet is a completely different thing. How do we get enough doses of the vaccine and make sure it's distributed to the people who absolutely need it the most across the planet? How do we do that? When I say we, I'm not saying I'm going to come in the, the lab with you. Uh, I understand that I'm suddenly taking any sort of credit. I should say, how do you do that? Well, the world's got to come together on this. The thing we're doing that's completely novel is these companies that are mostly in Europe and the United States, uh, they have factories that can cover Europe and the United States. But to cover the rest of the world, where most people live, they're doing agreements that we're facilitating with companies uh, in India and other places because that's where the high volume of vaccines are made. And this has never been done before. So we're on the phone quite a bit about, okay, is your factory compatible? How quickly can it get up? How many doses can you make? Because it's likely to be a two-dose vaccine and we'll probably want to vaccinate 70 or 80% of the world. So, you know, that's about 10 billion doses uh, that we've got to manufacture before we can really eliminate this thing and truly go back to normal. Um, without one, I really love the optimism of this, of the, that we're looking forward and, and all those things. I, I genuinely do, I mean that. If we can just look back for a second, because I think, I think, I'm, I think this is right, that around five years ago, you gave a speech where you talked about the, the possibility of an airborne virus and what it could do to the world and, and how monumental its effects would be. If you cast your mind back to, I don't know if it's December or, or January or February, when we first started hearing about this, what were your thoughts then when you first heard about this virus in Wuhan? And if you could have... What would you have done differently if you had the ability to talk to everybody to say, right, guys, this is what we need to do? Yeah, in December, there was some doubt. Was it 
transmitting between humans. But by January, it was clear you had some human-to-human -human transmission. And in February, uh, we got the foundation experts together. And I said, is this going to go global? And sadly, they said, absolutely. This will not be contained to just China. It'll get out to many other countries, including a lot that will find it hard uh, to test and quarantine. We still assume that the U.S. Uh, would not have a bad epidemic because we have more testing capacity, these so-called PCR machines, than any country in the world. And so we assume, particularly when we had people coming back from China, that we would test and quarantine. So it's, it's in February that the idea of getting that commercial testing going, that we really blew it, where countries like Australia, South Korea, have had a very different epidemic, kept their numbers low so they could do contact tracing. Uh, you know, now we can't go back. We, we have the big numbers, but we still need better testing, better contact tracing. So when you look at other countries, like, was there ever a moment where you were, where you were speaking to world leaders saying, guys, you've got to trust me on this. This is what you've got to do. Well, in February, our calls were with the CDC saying, you know, build a website, prioritize the people uh, who should get access to the testing. It shouldn't be who can afford it the best. You know, we could see that, uh, you know, minorities were getting sick more. And so, you know, we had to make sure there was equal access. Uh, the U.S. government hesitated to do things at the federal level. They hesitated to let the CDC step forward. And other, other countries uh, had kind of practiced uh, and uh, were much more on top of it. And so it all unfolded in February and March uh, that, much to our surprise, the U.S. became a laggard, even though the virus came here after it got uh, to Europe and China. Now... Like I say, I do, I do enjoy that you, you have, whenever I've, I will say, I think any video or clip of you that I've seen over the past few months, genuinely, I, I've taken great comfort in because I do, it's wonderful hearing somebody talk with a sense of optimism about the future. Uh, how do you think the world is going to change post this pandemic, post the vaccine? Uh, should that come along, and we really hope it does. How will... What do you think the biggest changes will be in the world as we know it post this pandemic? Well, we've really accelerated the idea of doing things digitally. And uh, so, you know, although the pandemic is a complete tragedy, this will accelerate our figuring out how to do online learning, how to do telemedicine. Uh, and we've really changed the rules that you don't need to go to as many business trips. You don't need to go to the office as much. You know, a customer doesn't now think, oh, if they don't fly here and sit in front of me, they're not taking me seriously. You know, I do meetings with world leaders now. Uh, you know, I was talking to Prime Minister Modi this week, and, you know, we can do 20 minutes when it's necessary. I, neither of us are making big trips. So I do think we'll come out of it. Uh, with our minds changed about a lot of activity, you know, the workplace will be different. Business travel will be different. Uh, and so that, that's the upside of having been forced to innovate in the face of this awful epidemic. Just before we go to the break, let me ask this. This can be related to the virus or not related to the virus. Just, I'm interested to know, what do you feel optimistic about right now in this at this moment well i've been lucky to be part of innovation my whole life whether it was the microsoft uh work you know magic software or now where medicine is advancing you know we are saving more children's lives and even this epidemic we know it will end uh because we will get a vaccine if it had come 10 or 20 years ago i wouldn't be able to say that so we will go back We'll get back to normal, and then we'll begin that gradual process where incomes are going up, where less children die. You know, so the world will be on a uh, on a positive track. And I, you know, I love being involved in the innovation that's going to help push it there, uh, even dealing with hard problems like like climate change. Stick around. 
More with Bill Gates when we come back.